Welcome back to Visual Trigger. So, um, got Frank Jackson here and, uh, Frank fucking rocks. So, <laughs> tell us about Frank. What about Frank? Well, about the tender age of 14. Uh, see, my mother and father split up and my father used to mess around with cameras and he had this Kodak camera that was made in West Germany called, it wasn't a retina, it was something else, but it was in a little leather case. And I remember he used to sometimes, he played around, he would set up lights, little, you know, blue, blue. <laughs> daylight bulbs. Oh, oh wow. wow. And he would, you know, he'd mess around, but you know, I think my father, he wasn't happy. So it was, he was dabbling around and stuff. My father could, I came home one day, he was sitting in a chair watching golf on TV, reading three different books, and systematically designing another piece of electronic stereo equipment. Wow. He would build that stuff for fun. Okay. His job at the time he was repairing uh, the electronics on fighter planes at Alameda Air Base in the 60s. Okay. And he lived in Oakland. Um, and then he got hired. He, he, he quit that job, got a loan, bought a big rig, drove that for a little while. Are you, are you kidding? kidding? Yeah. That, that's crazy. Drove that, for, drove that for a little while. Not, not, not I mean, just, just short haul stuff. I, but from like repairing airplanes to that, he was just like, fuck it, I'm, I'm out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because because um, he worked on electronics, not, not the engines, electronics. Okay. And... Um, he got hired by IBM after he got rid of the truck. And he got in the company, and it was like uh, a crack. Somebody that does crack. IBM was like cracked, and he sucked him right up his nose, and he shot up in the company like a rocket. Wow. Like within two years of being hired by them, they promoted him, and they moved us all to Sacramento. Okay. okay. And he was bringing them. They used to have this learning, learning a mobile home. He drove that home one night to show us, because we lived in you know a nice big suburb house, and he drove that home. And um, you know, things between mom and dad were not great. And um, you know, uh, the best thing that ever happened was they split up. And I remember he, he asked me in Christmas of sixty, in the sixties, he says. Uh, what do you want for Christmas? And I just figured, you know, I didn't, you know, I, he never asked that before. And I just said, well, there's this bike called an apple crate from Swin, the five speed apple crate. It was green and it had lemon crate, it was yellow. I said, I want an apple crate from Swin. Christmas morning, I got it. I was like, wow. And within two months, he was gone. Holy shit. And, and no, you know, it was, they got divorced and um, my mother, it was good they did because, um, me and my sister knew they weren't happy, and my dad needed to find more about himself. Uh, you know, um, and he did. He he stayed single. Got his uh, got his act together. Uh, met a wonderful woman that was widowed, and um, they start dating, and. Um, they say in the black community, you got to step correct with women. And you know what that means, because you know that if you don't step correct, Jamie, you'd come home, Jamie would be gone. She wouldn't say a word. Probably, Probably so. Well, you'd be lucky if she didn't say a word, but <laughs> <laughs> she'd be gone and you'd know better to leave her alone. Pretty much. I mean, yeah, for sure. And I mean, you know, but and just as like, you guys are good for each other. I mean, I can always tell people they're in good relationships. You know, I may not, I may not have ever been in one myself, but all my friends that are in them, they all have something in common. It's called bottom feet on the ground respect. There's things you just won't do. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. There's stuff you won't even say. Absolutely. Because once it comes out of your mouth, you can't take it back. You know. <laughs> that's that. Yeah, that's true. I mean. You know, I mean, my, 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 my guy friends are like, ah, oh, she's, you know, they'll, they'll dirt a little bit, but nothing, you know, nothing crazy. Right. 
Well, when did you pick when? Like after all, after all that, I mean, your dad making pictures with whatever that was. Was it an exacta? Practica? Nah, it had Kodak. It was it had Kodak. Kodak brought him in from West Germany. Oh, okay. Because the machines were made in Germany, right. but it was it was it, you know what it looked like? It looked like one of those uh, '60s Japanese yashikas, yeah. but yeah. German. Right. Right. And when he left, he left that camera. Holy fuck. But, you know, I thought, I didn't know, it wasn't working, see. Oh. I didn't know that. But he left it, and I got it, and I put film in it. I was walking around taking pictures with it. But it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it's like somebody gives you a phone, a cell phone, and you don't know it doesn't work. And you're just making calls, you know. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I used to draw. I thought I could draw. And you know, you, you still, still draw. draw. Well, not like. Let me tell you something. Uh, the way I take pictures, if I could draw like that, well, I fuck. never would have a camera. Come on. I mean, and you remember like Cartier Bresson? He drew. But dude, I'm sorry, he sucked. Like his drawing sucked. And like he, like you just said, if you could draw like that, yeah, motherfucker, would be drawing all the time. The time. <laughs> yeah, you know, if I could, if I could draw photorealistic, like some, some. What I realized about that kind of thing is people are born with that skill and then they then they perfect it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and I tell people all the time, it's like, look, you know, singers um, don't discover they can sing. They just they just start singing and everybody around them goes, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then then you get someone that shows them how to how to control that and get better at it. Um, so. Um, two years later, you know, I, I, I got, I realized the camera didn't work. <laughs> How many rolls did you put through it? A couple of rolls. Okay. Cause, cause see, the thing was, um, my mother never took me any place to get anything processed. So I soon realized the camera didn't work because I hit the button and there was never any click. Oh. You know, and I was like, there's something wrong with this, this, you know, that was part of my good mechanical aptitude but anyway um about 73 some people that moved in two years before that and he was a retired air sergeant in the air force and you know he did his tour in the vietnam war he was stationed in japan okay and of course you know uh he realized i like photography and he came out the house one day and shoved a an Asahi Pentax with a 50 millimeter, one four, and a telephoto. He says, I bought these at the PX in Japan. And he looked at them since I've been back in stateside. I'm not giving them to you, but you can do whatever you want with them. And so, uh, man, I put film, I put. So this is right before the Hunt Brothers. The Hunt Brothers ruined the silver market. Yeah, I remember that. Se 70, 1978? Those assholes. You know, <laughs> A roll of tri -X before they went in there. Oh, oh my God, God that's right. right. Was a dollar. Right. right. Was a dollar for 36 exposures. Overnight, it went to $2 a roll. They went to jail, too, those assholes. Yeah. yeah. They were doing some kind of insider trading on the silver. Anyway, um, I would get a roll of tri -X. Well, let me let me backtrack. Um, so before I got that camera, you know, you, you know, you, you, sometimes your friends have a camera. But one of the guys had access to dark room. Uh, and I was a reader. None of my friends would read, but I was a reader. So when it came to instructions, you know, I read the instructions on how to process film and about temperature control and that kind of shit. And so my film always came out. Of all my little core group of people, my pictures always came out. And I kind of didn't know what I was doing, but they always came out. And anytime I got some, even I'd take one of their cameras and I'd get pictures out of it that they couldn't get. And, um, it dawned on me that I had a gift and it starts to scare me. And I said, you know, I'm winging this. I'm tired of winging this. So I started to teach myself to be consistent. With that same, with that same Japanese camera, the 51.4? Yeah. Okay. No, I don't have it anymore. I, I've, uh, you know, I had to give it back to him. Of course. But I mean, that was nice of him to let you use it. Oh yeah. He was collecting dust in a drawer, but it was great to get it. Um, but let me tell you, 
So that was in, so in 70, in 73, yeah, at the end of 73, I ended up working at a hamburger stand called the Pit, Pit, Pit Stop. And the guy that took took over from he took it over from this young entrepreneur that had disappeared, and this guy called us all back to the business, and it was like night and day. the The young entrepreneur that ran the business was this he was a shyster. He was twenty four years old, drove a Lincoln Continental, you know. Uh, <laughs> it was called Queer's Burgers, and you know he was a young little sleazy businessman. Anyway, the business went out, he went out of business, so the. Uh, New owner came in, and he was uh, one of those race cars that go in one direction, and they they have a a scoop on them. It's a um, something dirt track. Yeah, so he was he was a midget, midget. Midgets. midgets. Yeah, midget racer. So he was a big midget racer. Where are we allowed to say midgets now? Well, hey man, you know. Or were they short people? people what are you gonna call it? Little person racer? Little person racer. <laughs> just, oh, oh my god. god. Enough with the political correctness, all right? Sometimes you gotta call a spade a spade. And it's a midget. It's a little car. Yeah. So um I got you know, he the guy disappeared. I, I, he's probably in a hole somewhere, people are looking for him. But the new guy he called us all back and he said, look, I'm opening the place again. And he goes, uh, I'm giving you all a race. And he goes, uh, I believe in good products, good ingredients. So he went, he bought like, he bought the best hamburger patties. The other guy was buying uh 40% textured vegetable protein. Uh-huh. This dude's buying 80% beef. That's a nice thing. All the milkshake flavors were real. And he said, I don't care what you eat. Just write it down so I can claim it on my taxes. You want to give your friends food? I don't give a shit. Just write it down. Yeah. And then, so, after being there for two months, he goes, I want you to be manager. I was like, hey, man, I don't want to be manager. He goes, look, you do what I tell you. You keep everybody straight. I want you to be manager. I was like, all right. You gave me a raise. And so, I knew the local kids. So, little hoodlums, you know, these guys, I remember one day one of them showed up. They drove up. They used to go through the driver window, and they would beg for food, right? And so the ice bucket was inside the window, and the fryers were right here. So they would they would get me to distract me, and then they would reach in an ice bucket and throw ice in the fryer. And when I heard plop, we would dive like somebody doing a hand grenade because I. Oh. And you know, I was like, you. <laughs> oh, motherfucker. And one day. One of them was in the back of a pickup truck and the driver window pulls a gun out. Look what I got. And I, and I said, what are you doing? Man, are you crazy? The cops are going to get you for that. Put that thing away. You know? So uh, two weeks later, they show up and go, we know you like photography. We go, yeah. He goes, we got a couple of cameras. Said, oh, you do, huh? No yeah, said, we got these funny looking box cameras. I was like, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, let me see what you got. So they come by, I think the next day, they come by and he put this little old leather case up. One was an old Pentacon. The other was a Hasselblad 500C with a meter and wine knob. Wow. And I'm like, how much for the, this, this camera here? Oh, it's 75 bucks. I'm like, okay. My boss's partner was chief of detectives in Sacramento. And he ran the number. I got to keep it. Because it came back, nobody reported it. Wow. Got to keep it. And so I went from dreaming of owning a Hasselblad to owning, and it, made, it was a 500C. I know, but you know what the thing is? The, the whatever the, the, you call it, God, the, the universe, it knew that you needed that. Let me, let me explain. Let me, let me, we'll, we'll talk about that. That's going to come up again because, you know, as you know, I'm not supposed to be alive. And somehow something to keep my ass alive for something. And maybe it'll be revealed. I hope that, I hope whatever is revealed and why I'm being kept alive, that when I'm called upon to repay it, that I do the right thing and, and, and act accordingly. But uh, so it had the meter wine knob, it had waist level prism, had an old 80 millimeter chrome lens and one magazine. And I was putting slide film in it. 
you know, I was putting black and white film in it. And how I learned to taught myself photography is I would take an egg and I'd put an egg in a window and I would let the, the light play it and I'd shoot pictures so I got that thing to come out right. Wow. That egg to come out right, I knew I was on to something. And um, I would shoot anything the light made look good. Anything. You know, trash, anything. And then, and usually even to this day, if someone says to me, I want to learn from you, I'm like, all right, well, you can, I'm going to bore you, but like Brett when, Brett, when Brett asked me to start teaching him, um, I said, because, you know, he says, I want to learn lighting. I said, all right, because when I was living at Bruce's, I had all that space and all those lights. I said, bring me something from your house. We'll take a picture of that. And so he brought me, he thought he was going to be funny. He brought me some chrome candlesticks. And I shot, lit the hell out of them. We shot them. He's like, wow. I said, hey, man, I, you can bring anything you want. I can, I can light it and shoot. Right. right. Next thing he brought was some terracotta Chinese uh, figurines he bought. They were about 12 inches tall okay. and, and on a trip to China. And then he goes, well, I want to shoot girls. So we started shooting. Um, he would hire Glamour Nudes. We did Glamour Nudes, you know. His wife would get the makeup for him, and we'd, we'd call him up, and they'd show up at the studio. Um, we, they'd sign a release, and that's how I got some of the coolest shots with the coffee cup with one, one of the girls that uh, had tattoos. Right. right. And I got some cool shots of her. Um, I mean, I, I've seen that coffee cup on asses bellies i mean it is i actually like it more now broken than i do when it wasn't broken well there's that whole japanese thing about when you break something and you put it back together there's this whole fame i don't know i, I looked it up because I, I, I said you know they, they, do, they do that art where they fill it in with silver or gold that's and i'm like i'm i like it cracked i don't need to go there because i have a friend of mine that can do that for me i can send it he's a master master jeweler and i could send it to him and he could fill in the cracks with with, with silver. He would act, you know, he would probably do. He'd be the only one to do a good job at it. But I'm not. I like it broken. So I still can't believe you broke that motherfucker. I broke it. I broke it right when. Um, I know. Right in front of Justin in at Fotokina in Germany. Yeah. And you know what? I wasn't pissed. I was like, you know, I've been carrying this thing around for ten years all over the world. And I said, that was supposed to happen. And I actually like it more now, you know? Um, and, you know, the funny thing is, we're, did you have that cup when we met accidentally in fucking 1998 in fucking Paris? No, no, I was shooting coffee cups, but I wasn't, I didn't have okay. a cup I traveled with. I was still only on find them on the table, don't touch them. Right. So it's the yin and yang, you know? <laughs> It's sort of like life, you know, some things you have control of and some things you don't. And things you don't, how we as human beings really screw ourselves up is we get pissed off about stuff that's out of our control. Absolutely. And think, and think we have the right to, you know, and then you find out it's like, you know, the magic man goes, oh, yeah, <laughs> you think you got this? You ain't got nothing. You don't get nothing. I mean, you look, a lot, you're going to have a whole lot less than nothing when I'm done with you. Right. And look what's going on now. Wow. Yeah, you keep you keep trying me, keep trying me. You're gonna find out, you know. Um, so, uh, Hasselblad 500C. Yeah. So, I the other camera. And then later on, I ended up with my first 35 millimeter was a Olympus OM1 with a 51 4. Fantastic, Fantastic camera. camera. Yeah, they 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 were the Sony of their day. They made the small. <sighs> Pro yeah. full functioning camera with great lenses. And I had that, I took that camera my first year, my only year of college. I left LA and went to Huntsville, Alabama with a Hasselblad and an OM1. And I ended up getting a job. I got hired by the yearbook. And of course, of course you did. They're so they're so unorganized. I did all the shooting and they're so unorganized, I never got paid for it. You know, but but that's par for the course of that college. But uh, nonetheless, it's also par for the course of being a freelance photographer. <laughs> well, I was a student there. I know, but you're still freelancing essentially. Really? You know, yeah. So, so um, my counselor had asked me when I got there. He goes, well, "What do you want to do?" I said, "I'm a photographer." He says, "No, you don't." 
you see, in the black community, the, the, the adults always try to help the young ones get respectable jobs because yeah. that's why you'll see non-whites will always wear a suit in places they don't need to wear a suit because it, it's a sign of respect. I never knew that. That's why a family that can barely afford it in the old days would always drive a brand new big ass car. Interesting. You know, okay. and you know, it was a, a sign of I've made it, I've got this car. You know, you didn't go to their house, but they pull up to the, where they want to go in the car. So wow. that is why that is why a lot of times um you'll see a lot of the Koreans in the business always have uh, the best Mercedes Benz, you know, uh, a sign of respect. Yeah. yeah. You know, the thing I admire about the Korean business people is they have associations that help each other. They will pool their money. You become part of that. They pool their money to keep you afloat. And, you know, I'm like, I said, you know, that's a, that's actually a kind of a wonderful kind of thing, especially when on the up and up. I mean, it can go south on you. Some of them go south, but all of them aren't bad. No, well, the, the funny thing is, is that when when I went to to Korea on assignment, that's when I really started. Like, I was like, these fucking people rock. Like, these are the nicest, coolest people. And like, you you go to Boo's uh, Philly cheesesteak, right? You've been there with Brett. That kid works harder than anybody you're ever gonna see. Andrew on that guy works. When people tell me, oh, I work so hard, I'm like, yeah, you, you don't work that hard. And I'm a, la I'm a lazy motherfucker compared to this guy. And I tell them all the time. Uh, yeah, they bust their ass. I remember George Foon, who George had a, st he, 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 his business was, I think he was, he was doing t-shirts. This was back in the nineties, early nineties. He was doing t-shirts and he was hooked up with the hip hop guys, but his, his background was. He's a Korean dude, but he, you know, he was hip, like the brothers. And um, his family had a store on the hood, and everybody loved him. You know, they loved him, they respected him. He drew, grew up around us. So George had a store. You know, Max Yavnov was a photographer. You know the name? Yes. yes. Max Yavnov Studio was on Melrose near La Brea. Really? really? That was George's, George's rented that as it was called George's Department Store. Oh. It was on the corner of Detroit and Melrose. Okay, I know exactly where that is. This building, that building, you know, I'm telling you, if I could ever afford to get a building in LA for studio space to live in, that place is hip. Because I was going in and I was going, this would be a great studio. And he goes, some guy named Max Yablam used to have this place. I go, okay. Wow. And I was like, wow. So that was his, see, that was his kind of, fun business. He used to, he had, he brought in French pair boot, expensive French pair boot shoes, one-off clothing items, surplus stuff. And, um, he did parties and things like that. So, you know, I met George, met a couple of people, got some jobs, but that's segueing forward. So anyway, back to, back to my counselor. So the counselor's like, ah, you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a preacher? I said, no, I don't. I said, I don't want to lie to people and lay hands on them and pray for them. I said, I'm going to be a photographer. He goes, you'll never amount to anything. I said, well, that'll be up to me. I said, so I'm out of here after a year. It was a college in uh, Huntsville, Alabama called Oakwood. Uh, wonderful, beautiful campus, you know, northern Alabama, um, two hours out, two hours from, uh, Memf uh, from Nashville. Okay. Uh, so... Um, I sh shot, you know, shot pictures there and left, got in the car with my cousin who was from New York. My uncle and aunt were in New York and in, in Queens. Uncle Lip worked at a, as a, as a uh, medical chemist in New York city. And so I was, you know, summertime I went there and he goes, Hey, they're looking for a photographer. I said, really? So I had a little portfolio of my work, some slides I shot as a matter of fact. I went to my cousin's house. She's married now with kids, and she had a box of slides. I shot in the car. No shit. April 1975. Wow, dude. These are, yep, yeah, these are, these are, uh, I think these are Kodachrome. 
These are, these aren't these aren't these six. These are Kodachrome. Yeah, April '75. That was that was right before I left. So I used to shoot color slides. It's funny. I never shot color neck film, man. I always shot slides. Huh. You know, and I like color neck film. I prefer color neck film, but you know, back then. So anyway, um, got the job. I was working for the city of New York summer work program as a, on their newspaper. I was in freaking heaven, man. It was like, they're like, it was, it was like, uh, it was like I got dropped into one of those 70 New York television shows. Hold up, hold up, hold up. It was like, uh, the, 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 there were, there, we had, we had the brainiac, crazy, uh, liberal Jewish guy who was one of the writers, uh, you know, we had the older uh, New Yorican from Spanish Harlem, you know, an activist writer. We had the uh, <laughs> crazy smoking hot New York uh, mixed black chick that looked like Chaka Khan. Uh, cute little Jewish girls, Asian girls, black girls, you know, African kids. New York hot, all of us working together. And so... I would go out with the writer to do the story and I would do the shooting. And they told me, you got to process and your own stuff. So I went to um, Camera Barn and bought a Durst F-16 larger and trays. And I was processing my in the basement in my uncle's house. So I did all the processing. And um, so one day I noticed that my Hasselblad, the focusing was off. So I went to the camera store and I said, I got to get this fixed. So the guy picks it up, looks at it, and he goes, it's going to be about a hundred bucks. And I was like, all right. I looked up and there was this flat black thing with Leica on it. Uh. Said, What's that? He goes, well, that's the new M5. He said, a lot of people don't like it because it's bigger than the M4, but it's got a meter in it. I was like, oh, I've never really seen an M4. I'd seen the Chrome older ones, but in threes, I've never seen an M4. So I had no idea to know how much bigger it was. All I knew was it was gorgeous. And I said, let me see that. Didn't have a lens on it. So he pulls it down, hands it to me, and I'm like, wow. So I said to him, I said, how much is this? He goes, back then they were 500 bucks, 1975. That was a lot of money. That was 2,000 bucks, 3,000 bucks right, right now. And he goes, 500. And I said, uh, and he said, yeah, you know, if you buy it and give me an address for New Jersey, you want to pay the tax. You know, it's like, yeah, OK. So anyway, I looked at it and I said, how much for if I trade my blad in? He goes, your blad and 100 bucks. And I was like, OK. So I walked out of there. I saw my own one, right? I didn't have a lens for the light. I walked out of there that day with an M5 Leica. And I went home and I would just fire it. It just felt, it was like, it's so well made. It's just like sh that clack. Yeah. yeah. The, thump, the rubber, rubber top thump, you know. And then two weeks later, when I got my next check, I went back to the store and I traded my OM1 and the 514 and some cash for a lens. Guess what? Well, I think, I think you, you told, told me. me. Yeah. I, it, it didn't occur to me that I should have got a 50. Yeah, I know. Right. Well, that's still pretty. But yeah, but think about it. I've never used a rangefinder before, but I'll tell you oh. what. I'm a rangefinder focus and fool now. I'll... I can outfocus anybody in a rangefinder because you know the window. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know the window. Oh, oh no, I, I had, had that, that goddamn, goddamn lens. lens, dude. I was doing group shots with that camera. Way the fuck back. back. I was doing little jobs with it, you know, and um, the pictures came out. So. Uh, it took me two years before I bought another lens, and I've been back. I was back. At, I was in LA. I ended up. I was from. I was. I was born in Florida, raised everywhere else, lived in Northern California, and then uh, the job was going to run out. And my father was on a business trip to New York City. You know, he still worked for IBM. He's a big executive. Flat him around, and he goes, "Look, if you don't know what you want to do." 
I give you an option of living with me and your stepmom in L.A. You have your own place. There's a servant's quarters in the back. And, you know, you can be there till you get on your feet. And he goes, just let me know. I said, I'll be out here for two weeks. And he said, if you fly back with me, I'll pay for the ticket. And I was like, all right. So I thought about it. And I realized I should leave. Well, because if I'd stayed, I would have, because I had to leave my uncle's house eventually anyway. I mean, they were probably, they had to be getting sick of me by now, you know. Um, so um, he was blown away that I owned a Leica, you know. Think about my dad. He never bought me a camera. Yeah, he just left you a broken ass one. <laughs> well, yeah, he he kind of dropped the ball. And I mean, and, and and not that, and not that uh, it should be anything about that. But um, my stepmom actually was pretty pissed at him about that too, because he once again came to me one Christmas after he'd been married for a while, and he said, "What do you want?" I said, "Like a camera." And he goes, "Yeah." And it wasn't it wasn't about money. It was just he didn't do it. And um, when she found out he didn't do it, she was like, "You should have bought him that camera." And I think before he died, he said, "I should have bought you that camera." And I said, "Eh, you know, I didn't hate you that you didn't. You know, I was sad about it, but I didn't hate you about it. Um, it would have been nice." I said. Um, I think I didn't get to tell him this, but I, I think what I would say to him now is I'd say, if I had a son and he had an interest in something and it seemed like he was generally interested in it, I'd kind of do what I could to help him out. As long as he earned, showed me he's, he's working for it. So I would have bought him a camera. Possibly maybe not the one he wanted, but I would have got him a camera. But I mean, you had a like M5. I, I would I wouldn't have even have said, um, you know, I'll give you half the money. No, I would have been like, I'll get you the camera. Right. You know, and then and then you step back and see what they do. You know, and then, you know, that because, but so anyway, came to LA, um, got a part time job at Sears and Roebuck in Compton. Compton was still 10% white. <laughs> it was, the white folks were escaping. We lived in Linwood. That's where the white folks yeah. had gone. Yeah. And my father owned the old mayor's house, this beautiful modern, modern extravaganza house that I mean, it was pretty, pretty damn nice. And the, the mayor loved fine steam locomotives. And there had been this big gauge, the rails were still in the yard. And my dad told him I didn't want that, so I told him to take it. I was like, "Damn, I wish you'd have kept that thing." But it was the one you could. You know, oh my! Oh, it was pretty cool. I mean, it's pretty cool, but I always wonder about those dudes. Um, you know, oh, it's just like a guy that flies planes. You know, the difference is the train will never crash. So <laughs> yeah, except the, I know pilots; they're a little different than the guys who have the fucking trains in the front yard. Hey, man, you know, maybe the guy's drinking what he's putting in the boiler instead of putting it in the train, you know? Or maybe he's got little kids sitting on his fucking lap. Well, that's, a, that's another story for another time. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, uh, so I could walk to work. It wasn't that far. You know, I could walk to work. And I worked in sporting goods, housewares, and tools. And, you know, Sears still sold guns back then. They you did. could buy, oh, yeah, you could buy, it was like, it was like a turn. They had, the sporting goods they sold was like a turners. They sold guns, fishing rods, licenses. They sold the uh, the Ruger M, the Ruger M10, uh -huh. the rotary. Yeah. We sold a lot of those. A lot of wild stuff went on in that store, man. It was pretty funny. I remember one day, <laughs> drunk guy comes in with a World War I, uh, English infantry bolt action rifle and he's got a bullet jammed in it and he walks in the store I gotta get can you help me get this fixed and I'm like let me see that so he hands me the gun and I drop the bolt I pull the bolt out of it uh. and then I got the shell out and then the cops came and took him away you know and the lady said he was gonna go shoot his wife damn 
the gun the gun wouldn't have worked because he put the, he somehow put the wrong shell in it. But I knew how to drop the bolt out. Right. Uh, you are one mechanical motherfucker. You are one mechanical motherfucker. I am. So, but this is leading up to the story. So, uh, about six months into that job, my father's like, you know, the recession from the Vietnam War is, is over, and IBM is hiring again. And he goes, I want you to go take an interview for a job. And I was like, he says, I can't get you hired, but I can get you an interview. And he goes, I said, I don't know anything about electronics. He goes, you got a high mechanical aptitude. I watched you tear stuff apart. I didn't think you would pay that much attention to me. Um, I, I could, I could fix most things, and I knew what not to mess with. That's, that's the expertise. That's key. When not to mess with stuff. Yeah. You know? It's like I'm not touching that. That's mm -mm. so. The interview was. They hand you. You walk in. The guy has a stopwatch. He talk a little bit. He hands you uh, this metal plate with gears on it, and it's two identical things. One side works and one doesn't. And he goes, I'm going to hand you this. You can take as long as you want. And when you're ready, go ready. And then I want you to tell me what's wrong with it. So he handed it to me, and it took me about four minutes. And I looked at it. I said, ready, hit the stopwatch. I go, that thing's on. He said, toot, and he smiles and goes, yeah. And then he picks up, picks up a long, skinny thing, looked like a dentist pick, a dentist uh, probe, and it had a hook on one end. He goes, this is a spring hook. This is going to become your friend. He handed it to me, said, fix it. And I did. I just fixed it. Smiles again. He goes, we'll be calling you. And I said, yeah, yeah sure. Didn't believe him. So three months later, Got a phone call. Um, we're hiring you, and in uh, two months, get a suit and report to Wilshire Place. We're behind Bullock's Wilshire downtown, and you'll start your training. And uh, a week after I got that call, uh, the store manager, very nice white guy, classic white guy. Just, you know, just hair all done, wore a suit. And he was in charge of that store. And he says, hey, man, I've been watching you. He goes, we want to put you in big ticket sales. Because Sears sold roofs. Yeah, they sold houses, dude. Yes, they sold, yeah, they sold roofs, houses. Well, they didn't sell, still not there, but they did roofing. Right. They did pools. They did uh, all kinds of things. But back in the day, you could buy a craftsman house. And some of them are still around. Yeah, they are. They're very well done. He goes, he goes, he says, I think you do really well. He said, you know, these guys get 9% commission. I was like, that's a lot of money. And I said, well, I said, man, you know, I said, uh, I can't take the job because I've been hired by IBM. He goes, I'm not surprised. He goes, well, if you ever want to come back, let me know. And I'm like, yeah, okay. That's, that's nice. nice. See, in the back of my mind, I never forgot I want to be a photographer. Of, of course, course you, you did. did. So when IBM hired me, I actually put the camera down and didn't touch it for six months. I went through training. So I went through training, uh, did final testing, went to Lexington, Kentucky for final testing. Ended up, uh, my territory was, my, my, my office was in the city of Commerce in Santa Fe Springs, Santa Fe Springs office. And my territory was El Monte, Montebello. Yeah, that area out there, uh -huh. out the 60 freeway. So I was always out there. And then later on, my territory was South Central. Um, I ended up repairing machines at a place called WLCAC, which <laughs> I ended up being their photographer in the 90s later on. Wow. Yeah, it was a trip, man. Um, that's where I met Gordon Parks out there and got the photograph and did Muhammad Ali's pictures. So, um, yeah, I, 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 was, I was at uh, IBM for almost uh, three, almost four years. And, and I suddenly realized that I liked working on stuff, but I was not corporate. 
I wasn't going to work my way out of the car in the field into an office behind a desk and sit there and and play mental games in an office building with people. Right. It's not my thing. So I went to lunch with one of the old guys, and he was he was permanently in the field. You know, he was he was happy just working on stuff. And so I said, "Hey man, how long have you been working here?" He goes, he got this look on his face like this. And I said, "You know, I don't want to have a look on my face like that ever." No. Two weeks later, I quit. Cole quit. My boss was like, "You want to do what?" I was going to be talking. He goes. How can you do that? And he said this to me when I told him. And then when I left two weeks later, he goes, I admire you. And I said, hey, man, I got no kids, no wife. And I got to do it with my heart. I got to go with my heart. And, you know, hey. So what I did with my IBM, because I made a lot of money at IBM. And I was single, no girls, no drug habits. I was buying... Uh, I bought a 35 millimeter lens for my Leica from Frank. Right. Yeah. Highland Park. Highland Park Franks. And. What, Sumacron or Sumalux? It was. No, it was the soup. It was the one before that. Right. Before the 2.0. Sumo it, was like three, it was a what? It was, Sum- it was a weird. It was a weird Leica one. It was a two point. It was a two eight Sumeron. They made a Sumeron. It was and it was it was yeah. before the it was the before the uh Sumacron. And then and after the Cron they made the Lux. And the Luxes were all Coke bottles at one four. They're just so they're hilarious. You know, I mean they have a look. Dude, they're fu- they're fucking beautiful. They're, they're they're beautiful, but you know, look, if I want dreams, I wanna make the dream. I don't wanna have to be stuck with it. You know. <laughs> The spiracles are sharp. They're tack sharp, but the luxes were. I mean, a one four. Oh God, just. But the Japanese love them. I love it. I know you love it, Chris, and, and I don't hate you for it. Um, I have the Aspir. The one that the one that uh, Justin cleaned up for me in Seoul paid for my MacBook Pro. Yeah, I, I I got rid of a whole bunch of shit I didn't need or use, and there was no reason to have, have it laying around. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm a, I don't like to have stuff laying around unless I'm going to use it. So I bought that, and then Vivitar had partnered with a German company and the One Series. I bought that in larger, and that was a Schneider enlarging lens with Vivitar's name on it. I'll be damned. And their enlarger was this German enlarger with Vivitar's name on it. And I had that enlarger. Yeah, they, they, went, they went high hat, man. Series one, they had a series. They had series one lenses that were made by Nikon. Might have made them and put their name on them for their cameras, and all the stuff was this top notch, really nice private label stuff. Uh huh. So I bought that enlarger, and I bought a four by five camera. I bought an Omega D. Uh, yeah, the Omega D it was an entry level four by five, and then I bought a. A 210 convertible, uh, 210 lens that could, would convert to 300 when you took off the front element. Right. And it had, and here's the problem with those lenses, those 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 synchro computer shutters. Man, when they work, they're wonderful. But when they don't work, oh god. How much were those things new, those shutters? Because I I've never bought a new view camera shutter. It's always you know because now you. You, you, you can find them for 100 bucks or less. No, back in the day. Oh, back then? I don't know. But I, I'll tell you what. I would have gladly changed that Copal. It was a Copal 1. Yeah, Copal 1. Copal O was for the wide angles, and Copal 1 was for the normals. Okay. I would have gladly traded for one of the, uh, the, uh, the Seiko or the Copals because they just work. Okay. They don't ever stop working. That's the problem. So when you find a, an old blad with a synchro computer shutter or anything like a twin lens, Roly, and someone wants to sell it to you, I don't care how clean it is, ask him to hand it to you and you put it on one second and see if it drags. And if it drags, it needs to be fixed. Okay. Because they'll work at the faster speeds. 
they'll always sound like they're working, but you put them on one second, and it goes, it needs to be worked on. Yeah. And I mean, there's not going to be dudes working on those things for a lot longer. Um, Somebody will. I mean, you think? Because there's a lot of things that are bricks now. I can tell you right now, if I had the tools and a schematic, um, there's not that many parts in a twin lens. There's not that many parts in those things. They're just small. And once you learn how to disassemble it, you can figure out how to put it back together again. Usually with those things, it's first it's not wear, it's a spring has come off. Or the lubricant's gotten on the blades. Oh, I see. And then the, it gets on the blades and hangs them up. Right. right. That's why you got to be careful how you oil it, that those things. Well, right. I'm not going to worry about that ever because I, I just got a CLA on my, my roll. I'm not going to fuck with that shit. No, thank you. I would I would like to learn how to, like the shutter in this, this half-frame camera. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those, it's, it's a, a 40th of a second spring. Yeah. yeah. Those are, there's a spring... And it's on a it's on a smooth bearing, and you know they just work. They just keep working. This is old design. It's that's like a brownie, you know. So it's a modern version of a brownie, basically. And you know you've got fiftieth of a second B, and then it's got a sink speed. You know it'll sink. It has a hot. It really. It has a hot shoe. Yeah, it's got a live hot shoe on it. But I wouldn't put a flash on this thing. This thing takes cool pictures. It's half frame, beautiful shots. It's like if you took a miniature version of one of the the coolest kind of Holgas ever. This light type, and uh, it just works. That's good. Now you know it's it. You know the, one of the funniest things is I was scanning a whole bunch of uh, old stuff that I shot in France. I don't know, nineteen ninety eight, whatever, and putting in that slide in that that Nikon scanner and saying, "Yo, Jamie." You think that's Frank? Yeah, it's funny. I that's 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 a I don't believe What were the freaking chances of that? Um That just happened to me, man. That, but that was Jardin de Luxembourg, right? right? Yep, yep. And I've been back there a couple of times since. Um, like, because of that film you did, the Leica film, I was walking with Brett in 2015 in Prague and down the street, hey, are you Frank Jackson? And I was like, had a hat on. I was like, you know, all because it was cold. Yeah. Turned around and there's this little olive skinned dude with a Leica around his neck. And I said, yeah, he goes, I saw you in Chris Week's Leica film. It's like, hey man, yeah, I said, uh, he said, yeah, he said, love your work, love Chris's work. He goes, uh, I've been, I live here now. And he goes, I live in the Angel, the angel part of yeah. Prague, which is where all the cherry blossoms are. And that's where the famous Czech photographer, I forgot his name, um, Jan. Yeah. Jan. Oh, I put this on. this there we go yeah um he went to the uh we talked for a little while and um he had a chrome m6 love those cameras and um i bumped into i bumped into a couple of people in paris one time so that happens but yeah the, what, what happened with us where that's that kind of that's kind of wild 
Yeah, yeah that, that was, was a trip. trip. That is kind of wild. It's so funny. Right, uh... Yeah, you were taking a picture of a, a fucking spring, a red spring. I know you have that it's spring. spring. It's up on the shelf. <laughs> I took the hat in my pocket on the plane, and I was trying to find the right... I, I finally found the right picture, and it was on the edge on the Trucadero with the Tourifel. There was a cloudy sky. I'll have to get you that picture so people can see it. It was a cloudy sky, perfect little puffy clouds, and I had the 40 millimeter wide angle, and I focused on the spring, and that's the shot. So the spring is sharp, Tourifel is out of focus, spring in Paris. Oh, you showed, showed me that. that. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't ask for, you know. And Hitler actually stood in that spot in 1940. After he after he captured France, he in did? the same spot, same spot, you can see the film of him standing there. He never came back to Paris after that, but uh, that's pretty wild. Um, so I learned four by five, learned to process four by five film, start reading Ansel Adams' books. I was reading all of his books. I got a Palauzi scale. I got chemistry. I learned the metric system to measure stuff. I was making chemistry. I was trying to figure out the zone system, you know. And um, I was trying to find my film. And what the young guys don't know, and hopefully they'll figure out is, yeah, you can shoot all these films you're shooting now, but at some point you're going to get one or two you love. And that's going to be it. You can try all these different papers, but you're going to get one or two you love, and that'll be it. There ain't going to be no new, better paper. It's going to be that paper. Yeah, but right now, they're not even, they're not even doing that. They're, they're basically chasing digital cameras and chasing sensors. Yeah they're, yeah, they're chasing. So what they're doing is they're chasing their image on a phone or a computer to put it online. Right. You know, and, and they're never going to see it again. again. Yeah. And and the first thing I tell people is you got to print. Every time I've done a workshop at Sammy's, we printed. People, they lost their minds. It was almost like they discovered sex without condoms. You know, literally. It's, it's like the difference between firing a bullet out of the gun or throwing it. You see a properly made print of your work yeah um yeah we uh yeah printing yeah i i uh so all this to say what got me where i am uh it made me real proficient was i taught myself four by five you know it was all about four by five um I didn't think about 35. I thought about four by five and medium format. And I was always pushing. So I ended up with a Cyanar, you know. I uh, got my first Cyanar F, uh, the Swiss camera, where he pioneered uh, correction movements to where you could swing the front and rear standards and get your focus. And I learned how to do that. Uh, Scheinflug, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. You did. And um, he had a whole system. He had a whole system on movements. Um, they, made, they made a really cool camera, really smart camera. Um, you know, everybody, you know, that was like the Hasselblad of the four by fives was the sign arm. Right. And uh, that was a P what? Yeah, I ended up with a P, a P but I had... I had the F, F, an F, and then an F plus, okay. and then a P expert system with the case. Right. You know what? After having one, dude, I ended up with a Wista. Okay. That Wista SP, and I love. No, that dude. dude. I love that camera. I was like, I was like, I was like, man. I had all the attachments for it. You got yeah, that's your, yep. Yep, that's, you know, and, and, and honestly, I, I, because when I bought this, 
is a Wista SP. SP. Yeah, when I bought mine, I had the money to buy a master, master Linhall. And you know what? I looked at this, and I looked, I looked at the at, at the tech, and I go, why would I, why would I buy a Linhall when I can get this? Ca I had, I had the extensions for it, the bag bellows. Uh huh. I had five lenses for it, and I could pull that thing out. I was doing a lot of tabletop with it. You know, when I got when I ran into something where I needed movements, I pulled the sign around to it. But right, I. But dude, so when when I started with four by five, it was as an assistant, and you know, I that wasn't the funnest system for me to assist on. I, I thought that was a fucking pain in the ass, and if I never saw one again, I that would have been that was fine. Um, um, but you know what it did for me? Four by five taught me how to be fast. I could do four by five like people do thirty five. I mean, I could. I could, I could, I could, I could load 20 magazines. I could process 20 sheets of film. Uh, I could print. Um, and so when I went to eight by 10, it was the same thing. I went to eight by 10 and, you know, to be honest with you, if you shoot an eight by 10, you're honestly, I, I, I just look at people that do it and go, your pictures better be amazing because if they're not, you should be shooting four by five <laughs> because you're wasting three extra sheets of film every time you shoot yep. for nothing. You know, and are you printing these? Because if you're not, you're really wasting, you're wasting a shot, you know, two. So it's four times bigger. Dude, an eight by 10 print, eight by 10 and larger is a beast. The eight by 10 and larger is a freestanding torture machine. Yeah, right. And if you're, if you're lucky, you get someone to give you an old durst. And then, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a work of art in the corner of the room, but yeah, so yeah, I never I, I could contact print my eight by ten, but I could never print them. I almost bought an eight by ten and larger too. I'm glad I didn't. Uh, the eight by ten I had was R. H. Phillips. The same day I met um, the guy that makes the easels. Yeah. Oh, you Phillips. met that dude? Yeah, R. H. Phillips. I'm gonna talk to him. Oh, I met. I talked to the guy that that made the easels. Oh yeah. The Salt Hill, the Salt Hill easel. Yeah, I met Salt Hill. Yeah, I met him. Yeah, nice dude. Yeah, he had the larger and both sizes of the easels on display at eleven fourteen. You can get an eleven fourteen to sixteen twenty. Yep. Wasting money if you buy an eleven fourteen because why would you do that? You know, you're never going to be able to put anything bigger than eleven fourteen paper in it. A dude practically gave me a sixteen twenty Salt Hill in Seattle. So people, anybody printing in the dark will die for that. Oh, I would. I mean, my. Uh... The other one I have, it's a Saunders. It's a nice easel. Those are very nice too, but yeah, yeah. but it, 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 it's not this. This is a bullet or firing out of a gun. World of difference. World, World of difference. difference. I still need. Th they both will hit the target, but one does a whole lot more damage when it hits. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, I I can't imagine having any other. And I like to do off center borders on my prints. Yeah, you do. I like my eight by ten because I was doing squares. I like my square to be optically centered. And I could do it with this, no problem, anywhere I wanted. And I like to print on small, small papers. So the smallest paper I ever printed on was four by six or four, four by five. And it's hard to do that. On this one, it's easy, it's just easy. So um, learn four by five. And I was also moonlighting, fixing IBM typewriters. I charged, I charged what IBM charged. They charged 50 bucks an hour. And, um, you know, I was going to this architect's office and I learned how to shoot buildings. You know, I was pretty good at it. And so I met his assistant. And so one day, he was a Japanese dude. He goes, you photographer? I go, yeah. He goes, what do you do? I go, I do this. So I showed him some stuff I shot. And there were a couple of buildings in there. And he goes, oh, these are really good. He goes, can I show my boss? Oh, yeah, sure, show him. Boss calls me in the office and goes, I want to hire you to shoot my buildings. And I was like, okay. And I was making my monthly salary per week. Remember the salary I made that I did? I was making per week. Right. And so I've never been a businessman, Chris. And it didn't occur to me the guy didn't build every every building in LA. So I ran out of buildings after about nine months. 
but I made some stupid money. Yeah. And I had more equipment. And, you know, I was driving around a, a souped up Rusto Mod Volkswagen Beetle, okay. you know, with no back seat. I had room for my 4x5 case. Right. Which size engine did that have? It had a blue printed, weird 1679. Okay. Square torque, they called it. Right. So it would never blow up, but it would burn rubber like hell. Oh, people didn't realize a Volkswagen. Yeah. Crazy. Basically, it was like it was like a, a bathtub, a poor man's bathtub Porsche. And the smart guys will put a roller crank in there with thick heads, not the thin, you know, 2100 heads, yeah. but like heads that are just a little bit bigger than 1500. Uh -huh. And you square the torque on the motor. So when you put your foot in it. Oh, yeah. No, I, I rode in some of those and I was blown away. It was a. No shit. They were so easy to steal, though. The Beatles, oh, my God. So, anyway, um, I ended up running out of work with this dude. So, I ended up using my IBM unemployment for about a month. And there was an ad in the paper. I had the most interesting time staying at people's houses and living in my car for a month. It was, it was kind of cool. It was really cool. It was like, I mean, I was clean. I had a place to go eat. You know, I had money. And there was an ad in the paper. Trent Occidental Life was looking for someone with IBM experience on their typewriters to work full time in their shop. And they had a, a physical plant at the top of one of the buildings, the middle building. And we worked on uh, some of the elevator stuff. They're manual typewriters, and, and I was the selectric guy. And so I took the ad, and I went in there. And IBM trained us like uh, you go through, like, buds, okay? <laughs> Dude, they're not. You're dressed up in a suit, and he's in your ear trying to rattle you while you're fixing the machine. Because he goes, look, he goes, you're going to be dealing with some pissed off women that the machine's not working. You're going to be in a room full of them. There'll be a hundred women in a room that can all see you. Some of them are going to be hitting on you. Others are going to be mad at you. And they're going to find something wrong with the machine. And you need to get there and make them all happy. <laughs> that's they kinda, told us that, you know. It's kind of tough. And so, um, what was I going? We, uh, I lost my train of thought. Damn Occidental. Me. Oh, yeah. So I went for the interview. And so the guy that had been there had been there 35 years. I didn't know he was about to retire. Clem. Clem was really cool. You know, he was old country boy. And uh, so he sat down. He's talking to me. And so there was a young Hispanic guy about John had to be, John had to be uh, mid to late 30s, you know, married, two kids. And uh, you know, I was where I had a, I had a nice I had jeans on and a nice shirt, and so Clem bought John over to see if I knew what I was talking about. And I later found out that IBM used to offer a two week training class for companies that wanted to train their own people on the Selectric. I'm shocked they would do that. You're not going to learn. You know the joke was on. Look, you're not going to learn anything about that machine in two weeks. You know, you need six months. You need six months of getting your butt kicked by the by the instructor, and then you learn in the field. So I had six months of getting my ass kicked, and then I had almost four years in the field. So they brought a machine over, and they were asking me stuff, and I said, "Oh, you do that, you do that, you do that." And Clint was like happy, and John was getting pissed. I and later on, I you know I found out that John thought that I was going to come and usurp him. That wasn't my thing. You know, I'd already decided I was going to be a photographer and I was making money to get money to get a lease on a loft spot and I was going to leave there. So anyway, um, how it worked was we had runners to go get, the girls would say something with the machine, they'd fill out a, an order thing and we had runners to go get the machine. We never went and got them. And so John used to be a runner 
And then when he stayed there long enough, he got to be a repairman. That's everybody in that place had been there waiting for their spot. Clem waited 20, 20 years to become the head guy. And there was a guy into him waiting to take his spot when he left. Wow. And I'm like, that ain't going to be me. I'm not staying here for 30 years wait, waiting on a gold watch, you know. No way. And a cat on the back. So um, they hired me, you know, and uh, it, was, it was nice money, you know. It was like, and... It was, they had a really interesting system up there. So if there was nothing to do, we would put a machine on our desk, our workbench, with our tools out, and we could read. <laughs> and I was like, I couldn't believe this. I was like, this is crazy. So there was me, John, and there was a guy that was nice guy, but kind of an, he was kind of a disaster, kind of an alcoholic. You know, he showed up for work. And and then there was a Vietnam vet, another black guy. And this dude, he was on here. He was on here. He knew his stuff. They worked on... Um, okay. <laughs> With tapes. You know, adding machines. And, and everybody worked on the manual Olympias. They had those, too. Yeah. Those are easy to fix. You know, you put oil on them, straighten up the keys. That's it. There's nothing, you know. Um, and so... The deal was if you, if if they brought a machine and they put it in a in a holding room, if you walk back there and if you touch it, you had to fix it. You couldn't. Uh -huh. So what these guys would do, they'd read what was wrong with it and they'd walk out and leave it alone. I'd look at something and I'd fix it. And I was trained to be quick. So I'd been there. Six months, and Clem retired, and the new guy took over. I didn't know this, but he didn't like me. Oh, because John didn't like me. John thought, John thought that I was too good. I wasn't fixing the machines. It didn't occur to them that when I worked on something, it didn't come back. And I was fixing the machines they couldn't fix. So the new guy, John would get a machine, and he would sit on his desk for two days. And he would never ask me for help. And I, I, would, I, would, I, would never, I wouldn't have never rubbed it in his face or done I would have fixed it and kept it to him. I would have kept it between him and me. I wouldn't have said anything to anybody. And um, so we had our first review. So I'm sitting down thinking I'm going to get a raise. The guy looks at me and goes, you don't want to be here, do you? And I go, well, no, I'm planning on leaving one day. And he goes, okay, that's cool. That's cool. Because... I don't think you're fixing the machines. There's no way you're working on them that fast. And I'm going to recommend that uh, you don't get a race. And I was like, are you kidding? And I said, I've actually fixed machines that you've asked me to fix that your boy couldn't fix. And he says, there's no way you're fixing those machines. He said, they're not coming back. <laughs> Nothing I've worked on has ever come back. So what happened was he tried to get me fired. But the guy downstairs, he goes, you know, Clem spoke so highly of you, Frank, that there's no way I can believe that you're that bad. He says, there's nothing I can do except not fire you. You won't get a raise. So I went to lunch with, with uh, the other black dude. And he's, man, this dude, he knows this. He goes, Frank, your mistake was you're doing too much. He says, do less. I said, are you kidding? He said, he said, do less. And I did it. I got a raise next time. I love upward failure. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so this is what's funny. Um, there was an employee art contest at Transamerica. And I had gone to show the art director in their advertising department my portfolio. And he kind of just poo pooed me off, you know, saying, eh. uh huh. So later on, the employee contest came up, and black dude in the shop with me goes, you ought to hear your work, Frank. You got some good stuff. And I go, they're not ready for me, man. I wouldn't show the guy my work. Give me your time of day. So I, I used to go out at night and shoot night stuff with, with color. You still do. Yeah. You need a better tone. So uh, I was doing night photography, 4x5. I had, I bought 
The day I left, I, I didn't tell you, the day I quit working for IBM, I got severance pay. Uh -huh. I went to Henry's and bought a 90 millimeter wide angle lens from a 4x5. So I had a 210 and a 90. So I did this cool shot of downtown LA with a 90 millimeter. And I still had a transparency somewhere. Anyway, I made a print, entered that in employee art contest, forgot about it. Next thing you know, I won. <laughs> and also, the same art director's like, I got work for you. I was like, really? He's like, and you know, uh, the boss in the shop couldn't say anything. So yeah, he's, uh, you know, he, he's, he's, uh, because by that time, I taught myself studio stroke. Right. At this dude downtown LA walking around with a light meter. Walter, Walter had loft space in the old dance land building across from the convention center. Okay. You don't know him. Walter's job was he worked for landmark airport uh, buses. Okay. Yeah, I and wouldn't he know. Would, he would fly, they'd fly him, he would drive them to the airports around the country. He made $75,000 a year in 1984. Flying out, you drive the buses out, new buses. Yeah. And then he'd fly back. That was his job. And so he just, and when he wasn't working, you know, he had some downtime. He would chat up the girls and shoot. He bought Balcar. Okay, yeah, great. Monoblocks. And that I learned on a monoblock. And um, he had a flash meter. And I bought a flash meter. Um, and so I learned studio strobe. I, you know, I had soft boxes. I learned all that. I learned that stuff in a day. Mm -hmm. Um. It, you know, it really doesn't take – if you practice, once you get w how to work it and then you practice, you're good. I've always treated um, any kind of lighting source like a controllable window from shooting the egg in the window. Right. And um, i always very careful about what soft boxes I bought. I always bought soft boxes that really made the light soft. And I could either – they either – like the plume wafer banks – you know, when, when that guy left Shamir and went to Plume Wafer, I got wafers. And my signature look is because of the wafers. They oh. gave just this, this kind of light, and I was famous for using grids. So anyway, we'll, we'll get back to that later. So this is what happened. Um, the boss in the shop, he couldn't stop me from going because... Jerry, who was the art director, his direct boss was the number two guy in the company. <laughs> of course he was. <laughs> and, you know, the boss pulled me aside one day and he goes, because, you know, my lunch, I could take two hour lunches and I'd walk around. I had a, I bought, uh, at that point, I ended up with a M4, two M4Ps. I had two M4Ps, a four by five, a sign on four by five, two M4Ps, a... 28 Elmerit, a 50 Sumacron, and a 90 Sumacron, new style. And I would walk around with one of the M4Ps at lunchtime, whacking, you know, whacking shots, you know, uh, for fun. And um, so he pulled me, boss pulled me, Simon, he goes, yeah, I don't know why you keep taking pictures. You're never going to mount anything. And I just looked at him and I said, you know, I come to work, I give you eight hours plus and you're concerned about what I do in my spare time? I was like, wow, man. You know, I was like, so. Was that that country guy? That Clem? Oh. Oh, okay. This was the, the, the black? No, no, the black guy. Black guy was, he was, he was working on, the, uh, he worked on adding machines and some typewriter. Okay. He's the one that convinced me to join the, to do the. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, no, the, 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 the white guy that would waited 20 years for Clem to stop. Right. Yeah. yeah. That motherfucker. That idiot. So, you know, he's, and I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I actually liked the dude. Yeah, he was all right. You know, I was just like, he's just, he just doesn't, he just doesn't, he doesn't know how to live. That's his problem. So anyway, I'd be at the, I'd be at my, at my workbench working on a machine a guy in a suit, a very expensive suit, would poke us in the door. Hey, Frank, come with us. And get your camera. And they paid me. They weren't, they weren't abusing me. They would pay me a rate. They paid me a freelance rate. So the art director would give me, uh, he's, I need a good shot of this cup floating across. And I'd do that. And he goes, hey, at lunchtime, uh, John Wooden speaking at a luncheon we're hosting. We need shots of that at the meeting. And I'd bring a flash unit and the Lycus, and I was doing it with that. 
you know, I was turning all this stuff in. So after about a year of that, uh, Jerry goes, hey, I want you to meet somebody. So I'm in a T-shirt and Levi's. We were upstairs on the executive level on the 30th floor. And we go into this office and there's Cy Baitler, only executive with a beard. Crazy Jewish cat. Every other word I was off was motherfucker. <laughs> so I hear you the motherfucker that can take pictures. And I just said, yeah, that's me. And he goes, let me see some of your works. I showed him and he goes, I had drink shots I'd done. I learned how to use fake ice cubes. I did all, you know, all, I still have some of, some of the stuff around. So he's like, he says, wow, he says, wow, there's nothing you can't do. He goes, look, we actually have hired 10 different photographers to do 10 different things. You can do it all. We want to make you our corporate photographer. Wow, that's how that happened. And I was like, I was cool. I was cool, man. I was like, I was like, yeah. Inside, I was going, yes. Yeah, you were. He goes, uh, he goes, uh, I know you can do the work. Then he goes, um, you are going to step into another world. He said, you'll be flying around the world for us. You know, we do all kinds of things, you know. Uh, she said, so if you want to do that, are you interested? Yeah, I'm interested. He goes, all right. He says, don't tell anybody. He said, um, that's it for now. And um, so I left there. And then t- three weeks later, Jerry, the art director, Jerry was real proper. Found out later Jerry was gay. Oh, an AD who's gay? Oh, ma- imagine. But hey, and you know that, you, you, you couldn't be out with that stuff back in the 80s. Oh, no, not in the 80s. No, not then, no. No, he was, you know, he was, he was, he was a proper gentleman. Just, you know, perfectly dressed, real straight, kept everything close. So he takes me to lunch. He's beating around the bush, you know, and then he's going, so he goes, he starts him and hawing, and I go, Jerry, are you trying to offer me a job? Because whether I work for you or not, I'm going to be somebody's photographer. And I said, it's either here or somewhere else. I'm, I'm you know, and uh, I'm perfectly fine however it goes. And, you know, he's like, eh. So then Cy calls me on my phone in the shop. Can you come up here? I go, yeah, I came up there. He goes, so uh, did he offer you the job? And I said, uh, not really. He goes, I told that motherfucker to offer you the job. And I was like, so I knew I had it. Uh, <laughs> Um, and what he said, we said, look, this is how it'll work. He goes, you'll be, you'll start, uh, it was 80, it was into 83. You'll start, uh, cause we have meetings in January. We need you on board for that January meetings. And so you'll start then don't say anything to anybody. Um, don't worry about anything. So I kept my mouth shut. I told Ned, Ned, he's a, the other black guy, the other, the other, the vet. I told him, and uh, he goes, "Yeah, I knew something like that was gonna happen." I said, "Really?" He goes, "Yeah," and I didn't tell anybody else. And um, so they said, "This is how it'll work. You'll be on probation three months. After three months, we'll buy you whatever you want to shoot with, anything you want, wow. anything." You know. So I actually bought wisely. I didn't go. I didn't go nuts. I was like. You know, uh, I was real smart, but I didn't buy Leicas. I have my own Leicas. I bought Nikon because you can get Nikons anywhere. You can get them fixed anywhere, and they work. Right. You know, I said, if I buy a Leica R cameras, because I need a reflex cameras, and they don't work, a lot of stores don't carry them. What are you going to do? Yeah, you know? And I said... Uh, and I'll bet their service back then was even as shitty as it is today. If not more so. Right? That's the thing. They're embarrassed when they don't work and they don't know what they're like they're like they're like apple when you go to the the genius bar to get something fixed when they realize you're not happy and that they messed up they don't know what to do they're they're just at a complete loss it's almost like you don't want any more kool-aid no i don't want any kool-aid i want my machine to work yeah that's all i want you know so um 
So, uh, first meeting was January meetings, and I get my I got my bag. I had you know I had, I had suit clothes, and I went to do that job. I did all the flash and grin stuff. So my kit was an M4P with a winder on it, an M4P with no winder, a a Met potato masher flash and battery, and I did the meetings with those. Yeah, I nailed them in these dark rooms. I nailed them, you know. Uh, and these guys, most of these guys, never been on anything black. They saw somebody like me on a basketball court, <laughs> and a lot of them were hilarious, you know, the things they would say. And I just was like, really, okay, man, that's you know whatever. Uh, <laughs> and after three months, they're like, oh, hey, you you go wherever you want to go. We'll give you a purchase order. So I bought titanium F. Ah. I bought four. <laughs> Those are fantastic. I'll tell you why. Because you don't buy three. You need three working. You have one as a backup. You know, I use two most of the time. Right. Um, only had the only time one ever didn't work was I was on a cruise ship working for Transamerica. We had just dropped anchor in uh, right off of this part of Haiti that the cruise line rented for the day. It was gorgeous. It was an old pirate cove. And the uh, humidity fried one of the cameras. Other than that, <sighs> they always worked. But on that trip, I had my own Hasselblad and I had my own Lycas. I always took my Lycas as backups because they always worked. You know? Um, so you know what happened? You know what was really wild? The old boss had to inventory everything I ordered. He had to inventory all of it. And I never said to him, how you like me now? I never I never put it in his face, didn't do any of that. Right. He was like, and 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 John, the guy that uh tried, you know, didn't like me, he was like, hey man, how can I learn to be a photographer? I was like, I said, man, I said. <laughs> basically it's the love of my life I said I've never let anything get in front of this I said I walked away from IBM to do this that's how I ended up here right you know and I said it's it's not a it's not a it's not about it's a passion it's I tell people about you I say my buddy Chris Weeks he walks around with an MP film like on his shoulder with film in it. And he shoots it. For no other reason, just because he wants to. I leave the house with two cameras on me all the time, a digital and my Leica. Oh. And I shoot them. And I may not shoot them, but I shoot them. Right. Because I want to. Do I like everything I do? Nah. But Does anybody? I don't... Oh no! You know the thing is, there is there is a motherfucker out there that's like, you know, it's the same guy who you'd say like likes to smell his own farts a lot. Like he loves everything he does. He probably he's probably a YouTube guy. He's the one making books. He's the one charged charged up the butt. Like, well, not even up the butt. He just wants to sell a fuckload of them to dumbasses. To that's, how, that's how you know with a garage full a garage full of new books in your garage, you know. <laughs> or you see online, oh, we're giving these away. They do that as well. Yeah, th there's like I I, I can because I, I didn't know anything about any of these YouTubers or fucking podcaster guys. Holy fucking hell. Like did you see Willem's stuff? I sent you his his, his thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was it's fine. It's good. Yeah, it's it's nothing special. It's just you know, I I actually and he's probably got a million fucking subscribers too, right? Oh yeah. I mean, the problem with that is, he. I hope he doesn't. I'm hope I hope that, but I, it's not going to work. I, I was going to say I hope that he would not think he has the right to school someone. He should only tell them about his experience, 
And he should parlay that with the, look, I may not know everything about this, but this is what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to introduce you to some people that literally walk on water with this stuff. You know, um, there are people, there are young kids that I've seen their work and I'm in, I'm in awe. I'm like, wow, that's nice stuff. Consistently nice. Well done. I mean, you know, they're posting and I'm looking at pictures that are ready to print. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff we see, it, you know, your skies need to be, hey man, your skies are too light. You know, your fork, what do you, you know, what do you, you can't, no, you can't do it. The sun is not a white blob in the corner of the sky. That's not a good sunset shot. If you shot this with film, the sun would be round and the right color. You can do it with a digital camera. So, you know, you don't just, digital cameras aren't like phones. They don't take perfect pictures. No. You know, anyway. Um, so, you know what? I, we're going to pick this up again. Because I've got to go uh, go take care of my goddamn birds. I'm always taking care of the fucking birds. Um, and I can't get that fucking smell out of my nose today. Because I cleaned their coop. Holy fuck. It was, it's horrible. Um, I still can't. I got, I got some, I got some things to read too. You know, I, that, that I think will help. Okay. But yeah, let's um, pick it up and we'll pick it up right after this point and I'll uh, I'll send it to you and you can check it out and we'll get some pictures to insert you know some all right yeah you got okay. it brother well have a good night and um, let's talk soon